We are beginning a study in the book of Acts, and if you've been with us for the past month, you may be thinking, wait, weren't we already in the book of Acts? We've been talking about that for the past month. Well, we enjoyed that so much, we decided we're going to start all the way back at the beginning and go through the whole book. So this morning, we are going to just kind of look at an overview, and I want to highlight a couple key ideas, very important themes that are going to set the stage for the rest of our study. And what, if, you're, if you're unfamiliar with the book of Acts, maybe you're new to church or new to the Bible, the book of Acts is a history. It is a story of the early church. And the reason history and, and story are important is that they define us. We are history-defined, we are story-defined people. Now think of this individually. You have a history, you have events, things that have happened to you that sort of define who you are as a person. Now, if I were to talk to you about the relationship between my wife Mindy and I, I could tell you facts. I could tell you about how we met when we were 23, how we were set up by high school students, how we went through this very traumatic kind of bonding experience that made us friends very quickly, how we broke up for two years, didn't ever think we'd get back together again, reconnected, overcame that dramatic thing that broke us up for two years, and we were happily married. But I wouldn't just kind of rattle off facts to you, right? I would tell you a story. I would tell you our story. And so our lives are not just made up of sort of disjointed events and, and things that happen to us, things that we accomplish. There's a story to our lives. There's a, there's a trajectory. There's, a, there's an arc to our lives that can, brings everything together and, and we evaluate and look, is there meaning and purpose to what we are doing? And if you look at your story, your, your personal story, if you were to look at mine, if I were to look at yours, in that, I could discern certain things about you. I could understand your values. I could understand your hopes and your dreams. I could sort of understand the purpose that you've attached to what you're going to commit your life to. So our history, our story, defines us. And this isn't just true of us as individuals. It's also we experience this as groups of people. Now think of, think of it this way. For most of us in this room... We are citizens of the United States. And that means something, right? There's a history that in, it is involved with being a citizen of this country, whether it be long past history, like the Revolutionary War or Civil War or the invention of the automobile. And we weren't there. We weren't there. We, we didn't walk on the moon ourselves. Some of you watch that on TV. But that we still share in that history, and in some ways that still defines us. And then for more recent history, we also, there are pieces of that that define us as people. And so as citizens of the United States, as Americans, we identify with certain values, freedom, hard work, ingenuity, cultural excellence. All of those things are a part of our identity because we belong to the history, the story of the United States. So our own personal stories define us as well as collective stories of the culture we inhabit. Now, in talking about history and story defining us, I'm making two assumptions here. They're very important. One, that the things that we're talking about in history are true. They actually happened. It makes no sense to define yourself by things that are not true. If I were to stand up here and try to define myself by being an NBA draft pick, it would be pointless because I'm not. As much as I want it to be true, as much as I cry about it every night, it's not true of me. And if we were to talk about the Revolutionary War and how it was won using lightsabers and how a young pilot flew an X-wing into the Death Star and blew it up, we'd be kidding ourselves, right? Because that is not true. That is not what actually happened in history. So it makes no sense to define ourselves by things that are not true. The second piece of this, though, is that in order for our lives to have meaning and purpose, in order for us to, to even talk about a trajectory or a meaning in our life, there has to be some sort of absolute truth underlining all of reality. 
If there is no truth underlying all of reality, then all this is is just a bunch of events. You live your life, you do some stuff, and then you die. And if there is no truth, it does not matter. And so talking about your life having purpose, trying to evaluate whether what you're giving your life to is worthwhile, is a fruitless exercise, unless there is truth, unless there is a standard by which you can judge those things. So we are defined not only by the stories that are true, but also by the truth that gives meaning to reality. So what am I getting at here? Well, just as we as individuals and we as a group of people are defined by story, so is the church. And the book of Acts tells us the story of the early church. And in Acts, we are going to see historical events that define the church, real events that define the church. But it's not only that. It's that two historical events in the book of Acts define all of reality. Not just reality for the church, but all of reality. So in, our, our, in considering the introduction to this series, here's the main point that I want to emphasize today. Here's what we're going to hang on this morning. The book of Acts shows us the story of the church is grounded in historical events that define reality. So two points to this. One, the historical events, and then defining reality. So first point, if you like to take notes this way. Acts is grounded in historical events. Now, there, in the ancient world, there's essentially two ways to write story. One was myth. The other, more sort of straightforward historical narrative, historical account. Now, a lot of us are familiar with the concept of myth, but what I'm not talking about is like myth busters, you know, that conventional wisdom that those two dudes get on TV and show that's not true. I'm not talking about that kind of myth so much as I'm talking about a genre of literature, a way to write about history. And so when we think of myth, what's better to think of is things like Greek mythology, if you remember that from high school and college. And myths in this sense were traditional or legendary stories, and they usually celebrated the power of some hero or deity. And usually it, the, the stories were meant to explain either some ethical truth or explain how some physical phenomenon in the, in the natural world is related to the gods. So you can think of stories like Zeus and Apollo, and Athena, or great heroes like Hercules, or the story of Prometheus who stole fire from the gods, and that's the explanation of how we have fire. And while myths contain some historical facts, there, there are bits of them that can have actual historical events, here's the issue. They're not really based in ultimate truth, ultimate reality. They don't talk about what really fully happened. So to say something is a myth is essentially to say, wow, that's a nice story, but it's not true. And when we read myth, we're not to read it to understand what actually happened in history and let that define who we are. Rather, we're supposed to read it and say, oh, those are great ideas, or wow, that's powerfully illustrated in this story. So myth is more about the ideas we can glean than the truth found in it as far as the events themselves. Now, historical writing, on the other hand, is different, right? It, it can teach things, but it also records what actually happened. And so it's important that what is taking place is accurate. And so historical writing is intended to define what is real because it's defining what actually happened, talking about what actually happened. And so when we talk about Scripture, and often when Scripture is criticized, it is called myth. And what is meant by that is scripture, yeah, has some nice ethical teachings. We can learn things from Jesus. We can learn things about how to behave and, and structure society in a righteous way. But if you're going there for historical accuracy, you're misguided. And there are those even Christian scholars that will say, we shouldn't read scripture for historical accuracy. We should just read it for the good ideas that it gives us, like myth. 
But the problem with this is that the book of Acts, and and really all of Scripture, defies being read as myth. And as we're going to see in Acts, Luke has no intention of us to read this as myth. He wants us to read this as straightforward historical account, truth that is defined reality. And so I want to look at how he does this very briefly. So in Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 1, Luke writes, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Very important phrase to open up the book of Acts. In the first book, O Theophilus. So what, he, what Luke is saying is, is essentially, this is part two to what I wrote in part one. And what is part one? Part one is the gospel of Luke. So put your thumb in Acts 1, flip back two books to the gospel of Luke, at the beginning of the gospel of Luke. Because the way that Luke opens his gospel, the way he wants you to read his gospel is the same way he wants you to read the book of Acts. So this is what Luke writes to open his gospel. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. So what Luke is telling Theophilus here is, hey, I've done some investigating. I've been closely watching and monitoring. I've been interviewing those who were there. I've been, I have my nose to the ground to come up with all the details, all the facts about what you've been taught about Jesus. And why is that? Because I want you to have certainty of the things that you have been taught. I want you to know that you're not following a myth and made up story. You're following what actually happened. And so Luke includes details in his gospel to show this actually took place in history. He goes to great pains to include detail to say this actually happened. And so what is true of his gospel is also true of the book of Acts. Now, I like the way that C.S. Lewis talks about how we should read the Gospels as history. Now, many of you, or most of you, may be familiar with C.S. Lewis, the Christian apologist. And some of you also may know that he he was a medieval scholar. He taught at Oxford, so he's no slouch as an academic. And he was trained by atheists and agnostics how to read texts, how to read literature. And so when he applied his knowledge of literature and genre, he made this statement about the Gospels and how they should be read. He writes, now, as a literary historian, I am perfectly convinced that whatever else the Gospels are, they are not legends. I have read a great deal of legend and I am quite clear that they are not the same sort of thing. They are not artistic enough to be legends. From an imaginative point of view, they are clumsy. They don't work up to things properly. Most of the life of Jesus is totally unknown to us, as is the life of anyone else who lived at that time. And no people building up a legend would allow that to be so. Apart from bits of the Platonic dialogues, there are no conversations that I know of in ancient literature like the fourth gospel. There is nothing, even in modern literature, until about a hundred years ago, when the realistic novel came into existence. In the story of the woman taken in adultery, we are told Christ bent down and scribbled in the dust with his finger. Nothing comes of this. No one has ever based any doctrine on it. In the art of inventing little irrelevant details to make an imaginary scene more convincing is a purely modern art. Surely the only explanation of this passage is that the thing really happened? The author put it in simply because he had seen it. So the point Lewis is making here, what he's reflecting on, is the way the Gospels were written, it was you're supposed to take this at face value, that this actually happened. This is a historical account. And the same goes for the book of Acts. 
Luke is saying, read this as history. This is what happened. And he goes to great pains to ground what takes place in history. Here is just an overview of some of the kind of detail that Luke includes in the book of Acts. He mentions 32 countries, 54 cities, nine Mediterranean islands, 95 different people, 27 of those who are unbelievers, chiefly civil or military officials. So here's essentially what Luke is doing. He's inviting historical scrutiny. He's saying, you're skeptical of what I'm writing? Well, here's the people you can go talk to. Here are the places you can go to see whether we were there. Here are the civil magistrates that you can go talk to whether that happened. And so for for his readers, he's saying, look, here's the data. Here's the details. Here are all the people involved. If you don't believe us, go check it out. And he wants us to read this the same way. He intends for the church to understand their faith is grounded in history. So church, what we're going to see is that the book of Acts is not myth, just trying to tell us nice ideas. It is the story of our faith. It is our story as a church grounded in reality. So this defines who we are. So, Acts talks about the church being grounded in historical events. That was point one. On to point two. Acts, historical events that define reality. Because the beautiful thing is that Luke is not just writing history. He's writing about historical events that define all of reality. He's writing about the absolute truth that gives history its meaning. These are not just some nice events kind of tucked back in the past that we say, oh, wow, that was kind of cool. These are truths that we're supposed to filter everything else through. And there are two in particular in the book of Acts. The first is the resurrection of Jesus. We see Luke mention this, the opening of the book of Acts, where he says that Jesus appeared And he proved through many proofs that he actually had been resurrected. So for the disciples, for the apostles teaching, the resurrection of Jesus was a historical reality. It happened. It was something that they could touch and see and smell. Jesus was there and he said, touch me. I'm not a spirit. I'm actually here. He he sits down and eats with them. Ghosts don't eat, as far as I know. But Jesus was saying, look, I'm here, resurrected. This was a historical event. But it wasn't just that Jesus rose from the dead. It was the fact that in rising from the dead, it affects all of history. It changes all of history. And so I want to look just very briefly at an example of this, how the disciples and the apostles, when they talked about who Jesus was and the fact that he rose from the dead, how this affected all things. So if you flip over to Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 22, I'm going to read some excerpts from Peter's speech at Pentecost. We'll talk about this in a few weeks, but essentially at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit shows up and people start speaking in tongues and everybody's wondering what is going on. And so Peter is explaining And he ties everything back to Jesus and his resurrection. So starting in verse 22, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. The Jesus you crucified, God raised from the dead. Now jump down to verse 33. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. The pouring out of the Spirit connected to the resurrection and ascension of Christ. Now, verse 36, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain 
that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So the gist of what Peter is getting at is as he's talking to the Jews present at Pentecost, he's saying, you know your history, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Moses, all of that history. You need to start interpreting that a new way through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the hinge point of history. You interpret all things through the fact that he is now resurrected and reigning. All of reality, all that goes on in this world, all that you experience has to be interpreted through the meaning of the resurrection of Jesus. And I think this is a very important question because here, here's the thing. We can argue about a lot of theology and some of that is good and needed, but sometimes we kind of get into the weeds with things and it's like, does this even matter? And so if you, we just take a step back for a second and say, if Jesus really is resurrected, does that not change everything? I mean, leave aside your arguments and your skepticism, but if he really is resurrected, that changes everything. That, that alters our reality. That alters the way we look at the world. That is now we have to take a lot of stock in what that means. And so church, Christ really is resurrected and reigning. That means that if you are in Christ, everything has changed for you. That means no matter who you are and where you are, the greatest reality about your life is not your job, your education, your family, the struggles, the victories. It isn't what's going on in the world. It's Christ. And everything points back to Christ in some way. You're going to get there some way or another. And so, church, let me encourage you as we walk through this book, the book of Acts, there's going to be a lot of things that you experience over the next however many months. There's going to be a lot of doubts and struggles and frustrations. There's going to be a lot of good victories that happen in your life. But let God's word in the book of Acts continue to, the, our, our center of gravity constantly being pulled back to this truth about Christ's resurrection. Because that is the greatest truth over you. And I know for some of you, Struggle is probably the biggest reality that you're facing right now. Victory, you don't know what that's like. It's been a long time since you've used that word. And so the, the reality of the resurrection is good news for you because your struggle, your trial, isn't the final word, it isn't the greatest word over your life. It's resurrection. It's victory. And not only is Christ resurrected, he's king. And so if you look at the world and all the craziness, it's not who's in the White House or who's running for the White House. It's not ISIS. It's not the European Union. It isn't any of those powers that are the greatest reality and have the last word. It's Jesus. That is why the resurrection is not only the most significant piece of history, it's good news. So the resurrection is a historical event that defines reality. The other is the coming of the Spirit. It's often been said by some that the proper title of the book of Acts shouldn't be the Acts of the Apostles, it should be the Acts of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit takes center stage in this book. And what he does is he comes or more accurately, Christ pours him out on his people. He gives the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit empowers the church. And you see a band of kind of ragtag, fearful people all of a sudden become really bold. And they start loving each other really well. And the more persecution comes, the bolder they get. The more fired up they get. And the reason for that is because the Spirit has come. The Spirit is empowering them. And so we're going to see some really interesting things. We're going to see healing. We're going to see speaking in tongues. And what, what is that all about? 
we're going to see the Spirit work in some unique and tremendous ways. One of my favorite stories is when Paul gets what's called the Macedonian call. So Paul is headed one direction on a missionary journey, and God gives him a dream, and, a, and he sees a man. And the man says, you need to come this way. We need the gospel. And I read that story, and sometimes like, that'd be kind of cool. You know, when, when I was praying about going to Bellevue, I, I didn't have this happen. I didn't have a dream and a vision and a guy show up. And, you know, to be honest, if I, if I did and I, I would have talked to Bob about it, he probably would have said, like, you know, there's a church down the street that's looking for a church planning resident. You might want to go there. But the Spirit works in some miraculous ways, some powerful ways. But if that's all we focus on, we're going to miss the larger and more important piece here. It's that he stirs faith. He convicts of sin. He transforms those who hate God and hate the church into some of the most boldest, bold pro- proclaimers of the gospel. And so here, here's the thing that I don't want us to miss as we're looking at the book of Acts. Don't miss, church, that the Spirit has come. The same Spirit that was poured out on the disciples at Pentecost is the Spirit that's here this morning. Do you know that? Do you believe that? He is here with his church. He lives inside of you. He empowers you so you can be bold. You can share the gospel. You can have victory. You can be obedient. Again, maybe you're in here and the word victory over sin, the idea of victory over sin just seems so foreign to you. But do you know that if you have the Spirit, the final word over you is victory. You can be obedient. You can respond in faith. You can know joy because the Spirit has been given. And so the resurrection and the Spirit being given define reality for us, church. See, here's, here's something that I'm afraid of for us. We're so focused on what's in front of us. And when we feel out of control, what do we, what do we lean on? What do we go after? We go after what's kind of tangible and in front of us, what we can grab onto and control, what we can see and touch, what we don't have to put our faith in because, well, it's right there in front of us. Putting our faith, putting our hope in something that is unseen because we cannot see the Spirit can sometimes seem pointless or seem like, what, what difference does that make? But let me illustrate it this way. I know you all or most of you are carrying cell phones, so please, please take out your cell phone for a second. Yes, the preacher is telling you to take out your cell phone. It's okay. You don't have to feel guilty about it. Take, just take out your cell phone for a second and hold it up. Most of you, if you were to lose this this afternoon, would go into some kind of panic <laughs> because your life is contained in that, right? You have your calendar, you have your apps that kind of organize your life. You do everything with your phone but make phone calls. <laughs> and it's useful, it's practical. It gets down into like the everyday sort of in your lap kind of life. But what runs that cell phone? Why is that, why, why, is it, why are we able to have smartphones? Why are we able to have all these apps and get on the internet and text? What's behind that? What's the power behind that? 4G, right? <laughs> can, you, can you see 4G? Can you touch 4G? Can you smell 4G? Is it, is it tangible in that way? No. But it's real, right? And it's powerful. And it affects you in so many ways. And so don't miss the fact that just because the spirit is not tangible and physical and he's right there doesn't mean he's not at work and not at work in the very minute details of your life. This is not just some kind of nice idea in history. This is right down where you live. He's working. So church, the historical reality that the spirit has been given, the spirit has come, defines our reality it's also good news for us. So this is what we are going to look at over the next, I believe, nine months. We are going to see the Spirit given. We are going to see disciples go in boldness. We are going to see miracles. We are going to see people speaking in tongues. We're going to see persecution. We're going to see 
miraculous conversions, we are going to see this amazing story of redemption that God has written. But it would be wrong for us to just sort of look at that as history and say, oh, that's nice, that's cool, and not see that this is actually an invitation. God's saying, this is your story too. I'm inviting you into this. Church, this is our history. You know, Quorum Day was a part of Acts 29. And if you flip through the book of Acts, there's only 28 chapters. What's going on with that? Well, the idea is, is we're continuing the story. This story is ours as well. And so we are continuing to live out the truths and the reality that God spoke of here. So here's, here's what, again, I'm afraid of. And if I can press for just a moment. Church, too often we treat the gospel kind of like a toolbox. You know, we kind of have the truths about, you know, Jesus died and was resurrected and if you believe in him, you can be forgiven. I don't have to go to hell. I go to church, you know, those kind of religious things. Be, be good to people, love people, you know, kind of have all these propositions and doctrines and truth. But it's sort of like a toolbox. We pull it out when we need it. We sort of pull it out when, oh man, I messed up, so I, I, I need to be forgiven. Or, oh man, I need to say I'm sorry, but you know, I, I can be forgiven. Or, hey, I don't, I don't want to go to hell, or I should, I should follow what is right and what is good. And so we, we kind of add these things sort of like, hey, I got this job that I go to or I got this education or I vote this political party. And, and so those things can, are good and they're useful, but they don't really get down and sort of define who we are at our being. They don't shape the way that we live and think about our life. And the gospel is not just a set of propositions, though it is that, it is truth, but it is a story that defines everything about us. And so when we wake up in the morning and we go about our day, we're living out our own personal stories, but the greater truth and reality is a story God has written and is writing that we're a part of. And so when, when things start to go sideways, when things start to get hard, and our sort of toolbox approach to using the gospel doesn't work, what do we do? We get frustrated and we start going after other things. Maybe this gospel thing, maybe this Jesus thing isn't what, all that I thought it was. Because we treat it so pragmatically that we sort of master it rather than it being the thing that defines and masters us. And so, Church, we need to see the gospel as a reality-defining story that calls us into, it calls us to submit, but it also invites us to live in the goodness of it. And so when things do get hard, when things do get difficult, I mean, probably over half the book of Acts is persecution and trial. But what gave the disciples boldness and faith and allowed them to keep pressing on, even in the face of death, is they saw Life through the reality, the fact that Jesus is raised from the dead and the spirit has been given. And so it wasn't just a matter of, is this going to work and kind of pull me out of my trouble? It's, no, I'm part of something much bigger. And so come hell, literally, I know that I'm safe because God is doing something in my life. And God is at work. Jesus is king. When we start to see the gospel as a story that we're a part of, and allow it to define our reality. It starts to blow our categories, but we also start to see that this is a life to be lived, and there's joy, and there's freedom, even in the midst of pain. And so let, let the book of Acts widen our gaze. Let God's word wash over us and see the great story that he is telling and has told. Now, if you're here this morning and you wouldn't profess faith in Christ, maybe you, you come because you're curious. Let me, let me ask you, what, what defines your story? What, it, what is it that you've given yourself to? And do those things offer you hope? Do you, do you have joy? 
Are, are they things that are worth living for? And so I, I'm not trying to, to bash you over the head with the Bible here, but, but I am pushing. And so I, I would invite you, come back. Come, come join us in this study. Come hear the story that God has written and is writing and begin to wrestle through your own story and what is defining that story. And see, is not the history defining reality of the resurrection of Christ in the giving of the Spirit far greater than anything else you could define yourself by or give yourself to? Let that challenge you. Let that push your assumptions. And know that this is a church that welcomes that, welcomes questions. This is a safe place to do that. So please come back, join us over the next months. And it will be a joy to walk with you and wrestle through these things with you. So church, God has given us a wonderful story to look at, to study, to embrace, to rejoice over. So let, let, let's let this study of the book of Acts define our reality and bring us joy. And then let it set the trajectory of our lives. Let it propel us into this city as we live our lives in sort of the minute detail for the glory of Christ, to make him famous in this city. I'm looking forward to this. And I hope you are as well. Let's pray. Father, we, we are here and we are grateful that our faith is not myth. We are grateful that you have acted in history to save sinners. May the story of your great salvation in Jesus, may the reality that the Spirit has been given to us encourage our hearts, strengthen our weak faith, bring us joy and cause us to walk out of here with just a desire to be obedient, a desire to live in the goodness of the gospel, a desire to find all of our life, all of our identity in what you have done and then go and tell others. Make us a church that so loves this story that we can't help but tell people. We can't help but talk about it. So we ask, Father, that your word in the book of Acts would change us and do a work deep in our hearts over the coming months. And we will praise you for it because you are worthy. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.